Welcome, friends and foes, survivors and killers. Let's sit around the campfire and talk about Dead by Daylight, specifically about my favourite killer. Today we'll be discussing the Plague, otherwise known as Adiris, and doing a quick overview of her lore, her character design, and why exactly her story is such a perfect tragedy. Okay, so I'm just going to get this out of the way now. You know my Saw video, where I spent the best part of 20 minutes elegantly avoiding simping over Amanda Young, mostly? Yeah, well, I might not be able to do that here. Because I unashamedly love the plague. Absolutely everything about Adiris I am head over heels in love with. Her aesthetic, her weapon, her power, her gameplay, her voice work, her menu music, her chase music, her backstory, her add-ons, her teachables, her visual and sound effects, her prestige climatics, even her trailer. All these things cater perfectly to my tastes, and I love it. The only thing, the only thing I will complain about when it comes to the plague is her paid cosmetics. They're all just variants on her base model and ideas that disappointingly say me. Especially when the rest of her design is so unique, which is why one of the few killers I plan on prestige 3 in the near future. That's the word I want you to bear in mind when you watch this video. Unique. Everything about the plague's design is absolutely unique and distinct from the other killers and the rest of Dead as a whole, which is why I'm drawn to her so much. Let's look at something that's very simple to talk about when it comes to her unique design, her height. To get a sense of just how much of a very, very tall glass of putrid water the plague is, let's start with heights we already know. Assuming Freddy Krueger is the same height as his remake actor Jackie L. Healy, the Dream Demon stands at 166cm, or just over 5 foot 4. That is 5cm taller than the average height for a 21st century woman in the UK today. However, the average height for a woman during the 6th century BC, which was about when the plague lived and died, was 133cm, or 5 feet. This is going somewhere, I promise. In comparison, Michael Myers, most recent appearance in 2018's Halloween, puts him at 191cm, or 6 foot 3 the same height as his new actor, James Jude Courtney. That makes Michael a pretty big boy. One of Dead by Daylight's biggest, in fact. By his model size, he's pretty much exactly the same height as the other heavyweights of DBD, including Bubba, the Trapper, and the Huntress. The Doctor, the Oni, and the Wraith stand even taller, with the Doctor presumably somewhere between 6'4 and 6'6. The Plague blows this out the water as she towers over even the Doctor, placing her at 6'7 at minimum if not a bit taller than that. She's not even wearing shoes. That's just over two meters of raw height, with her headpiece boosting that even higher. This brings up two very salient questions that I'd like to address. One, what is the canonical reason for her being over half a meter taller than the average woman of her time? Fuck if I know. Adiris' law doesn't mention her suffering from any symptoms of gigantism like migraines or insomnia during her life, and is not the entity made her bigger for the trials, since her clothes are the same ones she wore during life. Honestly, it's probably just for gameplay reasons completely divorced from the lore. Since she fires a projectile from her mouth, having her not be really high up means the player can cover a wider area with the projectile, so they just made her mega tall. Which leads us on to the second question. Why do I care so much about how tall she is? It's not that she's the only big killer, or that it really means anything beyond the gameplay implications, but it's important because no one actually seems to notice it. Look at how people understand Huntress. She's a big, strong Russian woman who throws axes at people, but that's just it, isn't it? One of the first things you notice about the Huntress is how big she is, but Plague is even bigger, and nobody seems to care. There are two reasons for this as far as I'm aware. The Huntress is noticeably big because she's also very muscly. Not to put too fine a point on it, but the woman's built like a brick shithouse. She's easily as jacked as many of her similarly muscled male counterparts like the Doctor and Bubba, so her silhouette makes it very obvious just how bulky she is. The plague really isn't. She's one of the few killers whose body type is classically feminine, which is something we don't normally associate with being 7 feet tall. Anna's bulky design erases her femininity and accentuates her height, but Adiris' design embraces that femininity so we don't need to notice her height that much. That combination of size and femininity is something completely unique to the plague. Except her femininity isn't the most obvious part of her character either, because the rest of her design just has so much stuff going on. She's the only killer from ancient times, she's one of the few killers with no mask or face paint, her weapon has dangling physics like charms do, she's the only killer that speaks in actual human people words, and that's just her aesthetic and sound design. I could go on. Again, the plague is unique in so many different ways that I could spend an hour or even longer talking about how well behaviour put those killer together. Much like Stacey's mum, the plague has literally everything going on. On a less subtle killer design with a bolder colour palette, like the bright blue spirit, or more loud artificial sounds, like a gunshot, the revving of a chainsaw, this highly detailed, complex aesthetic might be too overwhelming. 
It might just be too much set on top of each other, and your character runs a risk of becoming over-designed. But Adiris avoids this with a muted and natural colour palette of brown, khaki, and bronze. And no obnoxious and natural sounds to distract us. I'm calling these sounds Michael Bay noises of future reference. By keeping her colours and sounds simple, Behaviour was able to indulge a bit more in other areas of her design, and really make a more complex character. Behaviour doesn't do this very much, with the only other examples of similarly complex aesthetic designs being the Wraith and maybe the Blight. That's not to say that simpler characters are inherently inferior in some way, because that absolutely isn't the case. Sometimes, quite often in fact, a simple, iconic design with one clear idea, running through the whole thing like a stick of rock, is a very good way to generate mass appeal, and for good reason. If someone says, I want to play as a mad scientist who drives people insane, you show them the doctor, and they're happy. If someone says, I want to play as a cowboy with a gun, you show them the death slinger, and they're happy. If someone says, I want to play as a weeaboo ghost in a schoolgirl outfit, you um, call the police or the little number on the metal bracelet. If there exists a significant demand for a certain type of thing, a simple design that caters completely to that thing and plays it to the nth degree is very likely to satisfy that demand and become popular and well regarded by the fanbase that demanded it. In short, if lots of people demand a certain type of character defined by one aspect, they will often be satisfied when they get a simple character who embodies that aspect. If a simple character with high demand is basically a guaranteed success if you get it right, and a complex character defined by lots of different traits represents a risk, because it can be much harder to get a target audience for a character like that. When someone asks for a cowboy with a gun as the next killer and you give it to them, there's not really much they can complain about because they got their cowboy with a gun. As long as the cowboy with a gun is what they expected, then they should be happy with their cowboy with a gun. The plague is the complete opposite of this. She has so many facets to her design that there's no guarantee that all those facets will appeal to the same person. One person could say, I wanted an ancient history killer, but I wanted an Egyptian mummy instead of this. Another could say, Well, I wanted a killer with a vomit weapon, but I wanted them to be like a little girl from the exorcist instead of this. And they'd both be completely valid in their reasoning. They only got a fragment of what they expected, so they were disappointed, and I can't blame them for that, even though I love the play to death. However, the upside to creating a complex character with lots of different sides to them is the ability to break away from a stereotype and do your own thing. In other words, to make something truly unique. When you make a character that's 100% what the audience expects to see, there's not really much you can do with them to make them stand out from the crowd. We've already been over the myriad ways in which Adiris is different from the rest of Dead by Daylight's cast, but I'd like to bring particular attention to the clearest way in which she differs from her contemporaries. The Plague is a Byronic Heroine. What is a Byronic Heroine, I hear you ask? It's a female Byronic hero. What's a Byronic hero, I hear you ask? The Byronic hero, named after the English poet Lord Byron, is a protagonist whose struggle is defined not by external material conflict, but instead an intense emotional turmoil. They are often privileged, charismatic, emotionally and academically intelligent, and are strongly idealistic, but also display flaws such as pride, a habit of darkly brooding, and a lack of personal integrity. While Adira doesn't display all the traits of a Byronic heroine, she doesn't brood or sulk for example, she has enough of the typical traits of the Byronic hero to count as one in my opinion. The Plague's Law tells a story of a sickness overcoming the city of Babylon that Adira is charged with curing. Definitely an external conflict, not an internal one. But far more pertinent to Adira's character development than the disease itself is her resultant crisis of faith. Her entire identity was built around her inviolate faith in her deity, the Sea Goat, and the events of her story are just a conga line of traumatic experiences that she has to reconcile with that faith. Her struggle against a disease that tears through the population is secondary to her personal difficulties. She starts to realise that maybe her gods will not save her. While her faith is tested, the expectations of Babylon's common people pile up on top of her. She takes responsibility for their safety when nobody else can. That's where the lack of personal integrity comes in. She ultimately can't accept the hopeless reality of her situation and lies to herself, because it's easier than coping with what's actually happening. This unrelenting barrage of unavoidable hardship is something that's not uncommon among killers with tragic backstories. Just look at the nurse or the hillbilly who both just snapped one day after years of mistreatment. This creates a tragic villain situation where you understand why a killer is the way they are and don't really blame them for it, but that doesn't justify their actions. It's pretty standard fare, honestly, where a killer is abused or suffers for a long time, so their mind just breaks and they become a deranged murderer. But, in yet another demonstration of what makes Adira so unique, they didn't do that here. If you don't mind me going all biblical again, the end of her story reminds me of the Binding of Isaac in the Book of Genesis. 
Abraham's faith was tested by God through the course of several arduous tasks that Abraham must perform in God's name. And the sacrifice of his son Isaac was the culmination of those tests, just as Adiris' exodus from Babylon with her followers was the culmination of Adiris' test of faith. Eventually, she comes to realise that all her efforts have been for nothing, that she's let down Babylon, its people, and the expectations that are placed upon her shoulders. Everything she's worked for, everything she's sacrificed wasn't enough. She failed. If Adiris was like the other killers, this would be where she'd snapped. The realisation that she'd wasted her life and failed of the only goal she'd ever cared about would break her mind. She'd have lashed out at her followers in a fit of rage. She'd have renounced the gods she once held dear and let the entity take her. But she didn't. Like Abraham, she kept her faith. And even with her last breaths and the weight of immense disappointment on her shoulders, she kept on going. She didn't lose herself. Adiris was the high priestess of Babylon to the very end. In the book of Genesis, Abraham was rewarded for his devotion, not just by having Isaac saved from sacrifice, but also through numerous descendants and abundant prosperity for the rest of his days. One might think, in a moral story, Adiris would have a similar reward for her faith. But this isn't a fairy tale. It's a horror story. And what happens to her next is the most perfect tragedy Dead by Daylight has ever told. Adiris whispered one last prayer, the light of her faith still burning dimly in that cave, and something answered, but not what she was hoping for. She had drawn the attention of the entity, and whatever happened to her then to turn her into the plague we see in the trials isn't made clear, but we can take an educated guess. One thing to bear in mind, Adiris was taken by the entity after doing harm to absolutely nobody. She's the only killer to have never hurt a fly, at least as far as we're aware. It's a bit of a stretch to think the entity magically turned her into a crazy evil murderer. It would completely invalidate her backstory to have that drastic personality shift. For our turn to explanation, let's go on a journey together. Put yourself in Adiris' position. You've hit rock bottom. Everyone you swore to protect is suffering around you. And despite everything you've done, it hasn't worked. You offer one last prayer from ragged lungs and bleeding lips, a prayer for salvation. And it's answered. Something more powerful than you'd ever imagined takes you and unites body and soul again, gives you a new lease of life. Maybe you succeeded after all. Maybe whatever this entity is, was the god you were supplicating the whole time. Maybe the horrible play you lived through was a test of your faith and you've earned your place by its side forever, striking down those who would flee from its divine majesty. At least, that's what it's happy to let you believe. I believe that Adiris is as much a victim of the Entity as any of the survivors, because Adiris was, is, and continues to be deceived. She doesn't just serve the Entity, she's devoted herself to it wholly, because she has been convinced that it is the Sea Goat, that her sacrifices and efforts as a shepherd of her flock were worth it in the end. It has preyed on her desperation and pain, and turned her into a sick mockery of her former self. The very plague that she strove so hard to fight now infests her body to its core. Even her identity, her name, has been lost to it. And that is the most beautiful tragedy of all. Because if Adiris was to ever learn the truth, ever to realise that her faith and good intentions have been manipulated and twisted into the service of a cruel and bloodthirsty new master, what would she do? I mean, how would you react if the one reward you got for a lifetime of devotion, sacrifice and hard work in the name of those who looked up to you was revealed to be just another lie? What happens when someone's faith, their identity, their way of life, their reason to live itself is broken completely? What kind of person would be left off of that? These are questions that for Adiris' sake, I hope we never have to answer. Adiris is so much more than just another misunderstood villain. She's a fallen heroine. And that's why her story is Dead by Daylight's ultimate tragedy. Alright, so just a quick little bit of channel talk before we sign off for the night. Um, this video has been a lot of uh, a lot of work for me, and it's survived through building a new PC and getting it working. So hopefully my gameplay quality has been a lot higher, my rendering has been a little bit better, and my audio has been a little bit better. So if that's uh, shone through, then please do um, share this video with anyone that you can, give it a like, get the uh, algorithms working on it. Uh, future videos we're going to do, we're going to have a little bit of non, um, non Dead by Daylight content, 
coming out hopefully in a couple of weeks time to get with my birthday november the 13th um so that should be a nice little surprise also a few more um informal non-scripted videos not like this um heavily edited stuff uh, and i've started streaming too so you can find me at picture entertainment on twitch um, I stream on Tuesdays and Saturday nights from 7.30 GMT. Mostly playing Dead by Daylight, but we'll be playing some other stuff. So, uh, like, um, on the 24th, when this should be coming out, I will be playing o uh, the Overwatch Halloween event from half past seven GMT. So please do come along and uh, join in the fun, get in the chat, and we can laugh around together for a bit, celebrate Halloween, you know? Well, that's going to be it from me tonight. Uh, everyone stay spooky, stay safe, and have a good one. Good night, everybody.